So what happens in terms of isotopes for meteoric cements? Well, we've already talked about the uh, fact that the meteoric water will be depleted in O18. So you won't be surprised that if you look at where the meteoric cement fall, they typically fall at relatively low delta 18, so below marine values. And also what's interesting is they tend to have light carbon isotope values. They tend to be below zero all the way to minus 10 if you look at Barbados or Enawatak, uh, for instance. But you can see that there is a little bit of a range and this is quite typical for meteoric cement, that range. So we know roughly where it falls, but it's not an exact uh, number. So let's review why we have this range. And let's start with the carbon isotope and let's try to understand what controls carbon isotopes in meteoric cement. So ultimately, the carbon isotope of a meteoric cement will be uh, proportional to the carbon isotope composition of the CO2 that is dissolved in the meteoric water that precipitates it. So the question is, where does that CO2 come from? So there's essentially two sources of carbon for meteoric cement. One is soil gas. In the soil, we have organic matter that dissociates, dissolves and forms CO2 through bacterial process or simple oxidation. And this source is relatively negative because it comes from plant and we've seen that plants have a negative delta C13. So in this example, anywhere between minus 30 to minus 20 per mil. The other source is the surrounding limestone that can also dissolve. Now the limestone is slightly positive to zero because we express this in PDB and PDB is a marine belemnite. Now if these two sources contribute to the uh, bicarbonate pool of the, of the uh, fresh water in equal proportion, you obtain a composition that is intermediate in terms of carbon isotopes between the soil gas and the limestone. And if your cement precipitates from this source, then it will be somewhere in between these two extreme pools. So it, it is going to be somewhere between minus 10 and zero. And exactly how much of the soil carbon is incorporated and how much of the limestone is incorporated is going to play a large role in the final value in terms of the del C13. And now let's see what happens with oxygen isotopes. So we have this diagram which is quite famous for meteoric diagenesis. It's known as the meteoric calcite line and was introduced by Lohmann in 1988. So if we look at the distribution of our isotopes, again here we have a cross plot with delta 18 versus delta 13. And if we try to understand meteoric cement, the composition of meteoric cement over time, we need to consider water rock ratio, this, this famous notion of water rock ratio. So now let's imagine that we have two parameters here, which is the distance from the soil zone, which increases as we go up into that, uh, into that diagram, and time, so that's the time of residence of the water in the rock. So again, you know this influence water rock ratio, and the further we go down on that axis, the more time has passed. We can also consider three cement. One cement, cement number one, is very close from the host rock. Cement number two is a bit further away from the host rock. And cement number three is the furthest away from the host rock. So it's the last phase to precipitate. So the idea is that in meteoric system, oxygen is dominated by the oxygen composition of the water it is thought that the delta 18 of the cement will represent the delta 18 of the meteoric fluid. This is why we have a line here where many of the cement have the same oxygen isotope composition. So cement number one, cement number two, and cement number three are represented here as having the same delta 18. However, the delta C13 changes. Why does the delta C13 change? It's because there is no or very little carbon in the water. The only carbon you find is the dissolved CO2. So the influence of the host rock is much greater on carbon than on oxygen. Okay, so that's an important concept. 
which means that cement number one, which is very close from the limestone, is what is known as rock buffered. It has a very low water rock ratio because it's straight in contact with the rock, so it acquires the composition of the host rock, which is represented by R here. Cement number two, which is a little bit further from the host rock, is less rock buffered, so has a little bit more of the soil carbonate, so will tend to be a little bit more negative and in, in terms of carbon isotopes. And cement number three is the furthest away, so it's going to be the one most influenced by soil gas and least influenced by the carbonate um, impact, so least rock buffered. Now, if water rock ratio becomes extremely small, so if you have very, very small water rock ratio, you can have a situation where this meteoric calcite line uh, no longer applies and your cement start to deviate from it. So this is shown here where you see that the in case where you have very low water rock ratio the composition of the cement moves towards the composition of the host rock and then the system is completely rock buffered meaning that now this cement has exactly the same composition as the host rock both for delta C13 but also for delta O18, because despite the fact that there is much more oxygen in water than in carbonates, the fact that you have so little water means that the oxygen is dominated by the signal from the host rock. The other way you can deviate from the meteoric calcite line is if you are at the surface and there is evaporation, because what happens when you have evaporation is that the carbon isotope is representative of the soil, so it's gonna be quite negative, but as evaporation progresses, you evaporate, remember, the lighter molecule of water, so the ones with O16, which means that the delta O18 of the fluid will increase, which also means that by extension, you will increase the delta O18 of your calcite. So this is the meteoric calcite line and the two ways we can deviate from that calcite line. So that brings me to the summary for this class. So we've learned that in the meteoric um, realm, we have different zones. The Vedo zone, which is a mix of air and water. The phreatic zone, which is dominated by only meteoric water. And of course, the mixing zone, which is where the phreatic zone meets the seawater at the coastline. We've also seen that each one of these zones can produce distinctive cements and that some of them are so characteristic that if you see them, it's a surefire proof that you are in the Vedo zone, notably. We've also seen that for Del C13, what matters is the proportion of carbon that comes ultimately from soil, so, so from uh, oxidation of, of organic matter, and CO2 or, or carbon that comes from the dissolution of the host limestone. And the proportion of mixing between these two sources will determine the Del C13 of a meteoric cement. For Delta O18, usually there is much more oxygen in water. So if you are in a relatively large water rock ratio, the Delta O18 of the cement should be the Delta O18 of the meteoric fluid. Of course, with one thing I've not mentioned, the impact of the temperature of precipitation. So that's something never to forget but you can deviate from that meteoric calcite line if you have very low water rock ratio, for instance, or if you have evaporation. So in the next class, we're going to continue our journey into meteoric diagenesis and we'll explore concepts of kinetics, flow, and how and when porosity can be destroyed or preserved. <laughs>